You can see by the title, I'm going to talk uh, about climate change. I'm also going to talk about fisheries because that's the point of the session and that's what, uh, what my colleagues and I have been working on. But there's, a, there's sort of a broader point here in that one of the things, I, I'm an oceanographer. I'm actually more, uh, uh, you, you know, I'm probably more comfortable in sort of the space that we heard in the previous panel than I am in a, in a fisheries panel. Uh, but I've gotten, uh, I've been doing a lot of work on fisheries uh, in part because they're an important, um, an important part of the, uh, you know, of the, the economy and society in, uh, in the Gulf of Maine, but also because they're just a fascinating, um, I think, model system to understand how people, ecosystems, and climate change all connect to one another. Uh, and so that's going to be a, a, a big part of the story. So uh, this is the Gulf of Maine, uh, the region here. We are actually sitting on the, uh, uh, on the, uh, on the shores of the Gulf of Maine, uh, Cape Cod, uh, all the way up through the coast of Maine, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, and then usually, uh, depending on who you're talking to, you might draw the boundary at the northern flank of George's Bank. I like to push it out uh, to the shelf break uh, uh, out, uh, out there. This is a really interesting ecosystem. So uh, as Tatiana mentioned, it's, uh, there's, a, there's an important kind of historical cultural fisheries in this region. Uh, the pilgrims uh, who landed on, you know, on Plymouth Rock, they would not have survived that first winter if they hadn't gone to raid the, uh, or borrow uh, cod from the cod fishing stations on Isla Shoals and Monhegan Island in Maine, uh, where there were settlements that had been there for, for a couple of decades before the pilgrims arrived, uh, harvesting the abundant cod resources uh, in this region. But it's also a region that's changing rapidly. Uh, so this is the time series that we've been updating now uh, for several years. It's just the average sea surface temperature in the Gulf of Maine uh, and showing just, you know, change over time. So in the 1990s, conditions were, were variable but fairly stable. We took kind of a jump around 1999 up to a new, uh, a new mean condition but still quite a bit of variability. And then really since 2010 or so, we've been really, really warm. Uh, if, you, if you plot the trend line, our overall trend is 0.04 degrees Celsius per year. I'm sorry, I didn't convert that to Fahrenheit. Um, but the key is that that's about four times the global ocean average, right? So this region is warming at about four times the average of what you would expect to see in the ocean. Uh, the other statistic that we've put together is you can think about it in, in almost sort of like a percentile score way. Uh, this rate is really remarkable. Very few ocean ecosystems have experienced a warming. Uh, a warming rate of this caliber, and especially this caliber that happened between 2004 through 2013. And over those time periods, we've warmed faster than 99% of the global ocean. Could you Sir? explain a little of what that vertical axis is? Yeah, sure, sure. So what we do, one of the challenges that you have when you're thinking about, about trying to characterize change in a system is that you have change going on on multiple time scales. The big one in an area like New England uh, is the annual cycle. So we have Obviously, it's colder in the winter, it's warmer in the summer. So what we do is we actually characterize what that average annual cycle is, and then we subtract it from the data. And then at er any day, we can say whether it was warmer or cooler than average. And that's called an anomaly. And then we average those anomalies together over a year. So what you're seeing here is, is if it's zero, it means that it, was, it had the average temperature uh, over average over the year. Uh, where we're talking about uh, up here in more recent years, uh, you know, two degrees C above average. Uh, that means that the average temperature of the Gulf of Maine over the year was two degrees Celsius warmer. Uh, so that ends up, that's about um, just under five degrees uh, Fahrenheit uh, above the average conditions from the 1980s. So, some of the quick impacts of warming. Uh, first, we've had a few things that uh, I'm categorizing uh, as confirmed losses. And they're not complete losses. It's not like these, these animals have gone away. But these are things where people have been really able to document a connection between temperature and uh, a major decline in the species. So uh, Calanus finmarchicus is a copepod. It's a, a rice grain sized crustacean. It's right at the heart of the food chain. So it eats phytoplankton, the little green cells that Tatiana was talking about and channels that productivity up to uh, things like fish and whales. Uh, there's some new work coming out that's, talk that's showing a, a decline in Calanus from Marchicus in, in this region. An important predator on Calanus are right whales. Lots and lots of news about right whales recently. Last year, there were no right whale calves born in the Gulf of Maine. This year, uh, there was a headline uh, that made me want to scream in the Associated Press about a baby boom, uh, meaning there were seven babies born. 
that's still way below average and it's not enough to sustain this population. Northern shrimp uh, were an important fishery in, uh, especially in Maine in the winter. Uh, that fishery has been closed now for about six years because of low abundance. It's a species that, where the Gulf of Maine is the southern part of its range. Cod are another one where the Gulf of Maine is one of the warmer ecosystems where cod have lived. Uh, the warming waters have made managing cod uh, all the more challenging. Yellowtail flounders in a similar state. Lobster in southern New England, uh, in Rhode Island, uh, has been at very low levels, uh, and I'll show you uh, a little bit why that's related to warming. There have been, though, a few gains. Uh, uh, squid is, are now becoming more common in the Gulf of Maine. There's a potential that that could be a bigger, a bigger fishery in this region. Black sea bass and tatog are two other mid-Atlantic fish that, uh, that people are seeing uh, more commonly in, uh, in the Gulf of Maine. Um, other species that we could talk about as well. But the one I want to talk about uh, are lobster. And this is specifically a Maine point of view on lobsters. So this is the, uh, the lobster landings in the state of Maine. There's been a 500% increase in lobster landings in Maine since 1990. So right now we are harvesting, or in 2016 we harvested 60,000 tons of lobster. It was valued at $540 million, making it the most valuable fishery in the United States. Uh, so really a remarkable growth in a, in a fishery that's also done a really good job at building the value of the, of the species. And one of the questions we want to know is why? Why is it increased and will it continue? So in order to get at that, my colleague Arnaud Labris and I have put together a, a model, a computer model, that took all of the ways that we could think of uh, and that have been documented in the literature at how temperature impacts lobster, impacts their growth, their development, their ability to reproduce, and as well as the, the predators that are likely to, uh, to feed on them. And we compared the Gulf of Maine, where lobster has increased, and uh, southern New England, where lobster has decreased. And note that the scales are, are very different. So this is the data that we're trying to reproduce. So the first thing we did was we started off our model by using average temperature. So just holding the temperature fixed at the average over this uh, time period, and in Maine, uh, the lobster increase, uh, lobster abundance increases, but we don't get uh, up to, the, up to the, the, uh, the levels that we've had recently. In southern New England, it goes up and then it kind of levels off and you don't get the decline. And that's because in both of these cases, we're sort of using the average temperature. So you're getting everything kind of warming up a little bit uh, and then stabilizing. If you add the actual temperatures that we've observed every year in this region, you get a lot closer to reproducing the data. We do a really good job in Maine. Southern New England, we get the shape right. If we add, after 1999, about 10% more mortality to the model, which is comparable to what people think is uh, accounted for by shell disease, then we can bring this blue line down uh, and cover the gray. But that's, that's, so that's sort of the kind of the physical system driving on it. But this is a, these are species that are harvested. And so the decisions that we make about how we harvest the species have an impact on them as well. And in the model, we actually used, there's a, there's a difference in how the fisheries are managed in southern New England and in the Gulf of Maine. In Maine, and this is a quote from Steve Train, who's a lobsterman uh, uh, near Portland, Maine. Uh, so he put this on Twitter, it says, the small lobster, this one here, is about a pound and a quarter, so the average size that you would see in a restaurant. Uh, and the big one here was over seven, seven pounds. Too big to keep, so we let her breed for the future, hashtag sustainable fishing. So this is something that Maine lobstermen have been doing for generations, taking the large, not only pr protecting the really small lobster, but also protecting the really big lobster. And there are a couple of ways that they do that. But they throw the lobster back into the ocean with the idea that they're going to breed uh, and be available for the future. Southern New England, they have not done that uh, until, until very recently. And so we have that in the model as part of that blue curve. But one of the things you can do in a computer that you can't do in nature is you can sort of rewind history and say, well, what if, what if we had swapped the management regimes? And so if Maine had fished on the large lobster, we would not have experienced the boom. If Southern New England had, had protected the large, they would have held on to more of their, uh, more of their fishery. And the effect of the, the fishing, the fishery management effect is comparable to the effect of temperature uh, in this simulation. But what about the future? 
So for the future, we know now that temperature is a big part of the story. So we looked at the global climate models, and uh, there, there's a range of predictions that are out there depending on, on the climate models that are run. Uh, so, uh, look, so, there's, uh, uh, so we actually took the, the coolest model, the hottest model, and then the average, and ran, the, and ran our lobster against those temperatures. And running the models out through 2050, if we have a moder moderate warming, uh, we get a moderate decline. If we have more extreme warming, we get a bigger decline. But the really interesting thing to me here is that this isn't a crash of lobster. This is, re e even in the hot case, we're sort of rewinding back to the conditions that we had in the year 2000 when Maine still put lobster on the license plate. It's just we're not, have, we're not experiencing, we're, we're going to lose some of the boom times, but we can still hold on to a vibrant fishery. But that's out to 2050. And we stopped running our models in 2050 for one reason, and that's because that's where the, the scenarios, the choices that we make about carbon start to matter. So uh, the low CO2 case, you'll notice, uh, uh, is the blue. The red is the high CO2 case. Those curves really don't start to diverge until 2040, 2050. And that's because it takes 20 or 30 years for the climate system to equilibrate to the carbon dioxide that's already been emitted. So the temperatures that we're experiencing right now reflect the temperature, reflect the CO2 that was put into the atmosphere in the 1990s uh, when the Palmer LTER was starting. Um, uh, and so 2050 is sort of a really interesting date, uh, which gives me an opportunity to plug a symposium that we're running uh, later in the fall, Gulf of Maine 2050, where we're trying to bring together the whole community, scientists, industry, business, managers, uh, all around the Gulf of Maine and take a really critical look at what is, what is the year 2050 going to look like and how do we get there uh, in a productive way together. Um, but if you go out uh, beyond 2050 where these curves really start to diverge, in the low CO2 case, right, temperatures start to level off. And Maine holds on to a lobster fishery in, in, this, low CO2, uh, in this low CO2 scenario. Under the high CO2 scenario, the temperatures in Maine start to resemble the temperatures in New Jersey right now. New Jersey is not a lobster state. It has many great qualities, <laughs> but one of them is not lobster. So uh, just a few, a few quick points. The Gulf of Maine is productive, and it's changing rapidly. Climate change is impacting things that we care about uh, in this region. Plankton, fish, whales, birds, cod, lobsters, and fishermen, right? There's a human component to it. So in the future of lobster, warming is going to reduce uh, the fishery, but conservation can help, right? So there are these choices that we can make to adapt to the changes that we know are coming. But the long-range future depends on the choices that we make about carbon. And our future overall, right, you think about just generally in society, is that we need to adapt and prepare for change. We have change that we know is coming. Uh, society has to figure out how do we adapt and prepare for that change. But simultaneously, we have to also reduce emissions, right? We have to make sure that we avoid uh, the world where Maine starts to feel like New Jersey. Uh, and there are really clear benefits. And this, this came out very strongly in the National Climate Assessment uh, that came out this fall, that there are really clear, concrete economic benefits to reducing carbon emissions. So thank you.